So, Magic the Gathering is a trading card game created by Richard Garfield in 1993. I'm not going all the way into the history of that game, but it feels like I'm supposed to say something like this at the beginning. You know, just in case any of you silly billies have been living under a rock and don't know anything about this game. Anyway, it's a card game where you use creatures and spells and artifacts to defeat other players with your customized deck of cards. It centers around five major colors, white, blue, black, red, and green. Each color is specialized in what it can do and what types of cards it has access to. In oversimplified terms, white has angels, soldiers, and healing magic. Blue has wizards, merfolk, and counter magic. Black has zombies, vampires, and death magic. Red has goblins, dragons, and fire magic. And green has beasts, elves, and nature magic. Magic is set in a multiverse, meaning there are infinite worlds and planes of possibility. However, one thing they all have in common are these five colors of magic. These colors are what I'd like to focus on in this video, because these colors actually go quite a bit deeper than just the fantasy creatures and the fancy spells they do. The colors are paired using something called the Color Pie. One of the secretly genius things about Magic the Gathering is that the colors don't just describe their capabilities and what they can do. They don't just limit deck building for balance and gameplay. They also describe philosophical leanings of characters and those who use those colors of magic. But what does that have to do with being a pie? I hear you ask conveniently for the purpose of this video. You see, the pie is a description of the relationship that these colors have with each other. So what I want to do here is explore the philosophies of the color pie, the resulting ideologies when they're combined together, and then relate them to real world philosophies. When referring to color philosophy and identity in this video, I'm referring to the characterization and personality of the subject, not, not their game mechanics on the cards. There is a color pie that pertains to mechanics as well that you could look up and learn about, but for the purpose of this video, we're just gonna talk about the philosophies. We're not gonna be going into it into the mechanics of it unless it supports kind of the arguments I'm trying to make here. Yeah. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank Gamepedia, or however you pronounce that, and the MTG Wiki as my largest sources for character information and lore. Uh, without them, I probably would have had no idea what I was talking about, would have sound like I was making it up out of thin air. So, uh, let's get right into it, shall we? <laughs> Jump right into it! <laughs> Allow us to start with the building blocks, the basics that will help us understand the rest of this video going forward. We're going to delve into the philosophies of each individual color. Each one has a broad spectrum of ideas that rarely contradict, but aren't always present in every character who maybe subscribes to that color. There are heroes and villains who embody each color, so one color is not necessarily good or the other one's bad. Most ideologies, when taken to an extreme, can be dangerous and antagonistic, and while not all ideologies have good qualities, each of the colors have characters which represent the good in them. This is important, because if you look at the cards, you can get the impression that maybe black and to a lesser degree red are colors of evil, or that white and green are just colors of good. However, as I will repeat over and over again throughout this video, until you're bored of it, it goes deeper than that. It goes deeper than that! I've got a lot of examples going forward that you'll see, like Kanda in white and Yeheni in black being examples of the opposite of what I just said, which is super great. We will go into the color pie in Wooburg order. I will describe the philosophy of the color, then give some extra examples of how they fit into the color's ideals. So let's start with white. So white, we're gonna go with white. White is generally seen as the color of justice, healing, and protection. However, this is just a small slice of White's full ideological spectrum. When pressed, the extent of White's ideals can include oppression and persecution in the name of security. So when examining the following traits, consider the benefits and risks of employing such ideals. First up on White's ideological spectrum, we have law and order. For White, there needs to be structure. There needs to be some sort of code that people follow in order to ensure their safety. This can take the form of laws and protection, but it can also take the form of forced obedience and imprisonment. For example, in Magic, Hyksis the Prison Warden is an aromancer on the plane of Theros. An aromancer is a mage that uses protective power to enforce order or suppress the abilities of others. 
Hyksis uses his power to run his prison and bind the population. The next trait we're gonna go with is equality. White is often motivated by the desire to solve injustices that it perceives in the world. They can be generous and community-oriented. There aren't many good examples of this part of their ideology going bad, probably because equality is generally a good thing. Uh, what I mean here, I guess. I guess if the equality you want is something equally bad for everyone, like the horror that is the Phyrexians, then I could see it, since that's exactly what Elish Norn the Grand Cenobite wants to do. Elish Norn is one of the five praetors of New Phyrexia. They want to spread the magnificence of Phyrexia to everyone, including other planes. Essentially, Phyrexia is a plane of m metal mechanical horror of, like, guts but metal, and you infuse them onto your body, and they see perfection as this advancement of one's body to extreme proportions where it can do anything, but from the outside it looks horrible and grotesque, and they call this process completion, but spelled weird, it's like E-A... T-I-O-N. Anyway, to them, this is a form of equality and also a generous gift. The third thing we're going to talk about is governance, or just governments in general. The need for structure in white incentivizes them to create governments where people can depend on security and consistency. Whether that be a monarchy, republic, or even a dictatorship, white philosophy urges people to gather under the same banner, no matter who is in charge. Sometimes this can create atmospheres of oppression, like a military state. When safety and protection are the only goals, freedom and autonomy become an unnecessary risk. For example, Brimaz, the king of Oreskos. He is a spiritual leader to his people, as well as a military one. The culture of the Leonin people on Theros is that of isolationism. They do this in sake of safety, but Brimaz himself has reservations about it. The push to isolate themselves is a white ideology in which the people of a nation only want to focus on them and their government. This is a great example of a white-oriented character dealing with the conflict between two different sides of the spectrum of white philosophy. Next white ideology I would like to talk about is peace. For white, the idea of peace is supposed to represent freedom from violence and crime. The absence of war and conflict. This can be a sort of live and let live attitude, or it can be a closed city, a police state or even a contradictory war in the name of peace. The example I have for this is Daimyo Takeshi Kanda, Lord of Aiganjo. He wanted eternal peace for the mortals of the plain of Kamigawa. To do this, he stole a part of the spirit Okagachi, which began the Kami War. Kanda became immortal, and the war raged on for 20 years until the children of both him and Okagachi killed their respective parents to finally end the war. Sometimes in search of peace, white ends up causing even more violence. The fifth white trait or ideology is altruism. The topic of altruism is complicated and rife with edgelords saying, selflessness doesn't exist. Bro, read another book. And then you put Iron Rand, because fucking Iron Rand sucks. Anyway, but in Magic the Gathering, it usually involves angels or priests who heal and protect because that is the nature of white magic. Avicen, the angel of hope, is a symbol of faith for the human citizens of Innistrad. Also, she's kind of goth. It's really rad as hell. Anyway, Avicen provides protection and power to help the humans fend them off. However, her altruistic action is not without a darker side, but more on that later. Another good example of altruism is Lena, the selfless champion. Uh, selfless, right in the name. She is a knight who gave up her privileged position of power in order to help the common folk in the rebellion against tyranny. She would give her life for any one of the people that she leads into battle. She is willing to die for you, yes, you, on a different plane of existence. It's real, she's good, and she's a cinnamon roll. Anyway, we have another thing we gotta talk about. It's not the end of white. There's so many. Some of these colors only have like fourth traits that I went into. Some of them have like seven. Look, the thing is, I was putting together all this information and research and all of how I feel, because I've played magic since I was like seven. Anyway, the next one, number six on white. Collectivism. Like, we'll do it again. We'll make that meme again. We'll just do it. The Russian uh, theme song, insert here. It's a joke. Everyone thinks it's funny. We all do it. White is all about the group over the individual, working together and accomplishing things rather than relying on a single person. Hmm. Anyway, 
White doesn't expect everyone to fend for themselves and believes that people are stronger together. Hmm, damn, son! They want people to use whatever talents and skills they have for the betterment of everyone, and when White is leaning into this ideal, it's all about the redistribution of wealth, baby! <laughs> From each according to their skill to each according to their need. Oh, man. Cards like Knight of the White Orchid, Linvala the Preserver, and Timely Reinforcements all have a sort of mechanical representation of evening, or distributing, or balancing. There aren't many, if any, characters that represent this idea of collectivism with their story. But I think that's fitting. The idea of collectivism is one of many, rather than a single hero. And this is kind of the story of all peoples. Oh boy, White has a seventh one? Shit! The seventh one is Faith. The concept of faith in the philosophy of White is centered around a broader concept. It's not the same as faith in, say, our world. Faith in magic centers around the idea of trust. In magic, having faith isn't about religion and churches. Faith has real, tangible power in the magic multiverse. Faith in this sense is about one's trust in those they worship. Ones that they know for sure exist and see sometimes. Whether it be gods, or angels, or spirits, the faithful are fueled by the belief that the higher powers will be there for them. It's about the trust that those beings have their best interests at heart, and the willingness to follow their directions without question, knowing that it is for the greater good. For example here, we're going to go with Lyra Dawnbringer. She is a descendant of another angel named Rhea Dawnbringer, who died to save the Banalish people of Dominaria from Phyrexian invaders. Lyra uses the legacy of Rhea to inspire the people of the Banalish Church of Sarah. Their faith has a storied history, and sometimes Lyra is known to influence the politics of Banalia, using their faith to sway others' opinions. If I were to boil down white philosophy and cut off the edges and oversimplify it with one single word, it would be morality. Doing what you think is right. So, going forward, when you think about white, when I'm combining it with other colors and we're talking about it in different philosophies, think about morality if you can. If you can't think of all these other things I've said, kind of smash it down to morality. Doing what is right. Or at least what you think is right. Because some of the characters who I said were antagonists, they were doing what they thought was right, even if it was hurting people overall. Characters can change their color philosophy over time. If things happen to them, or they change their opinions on things, or their magic grows in a different way and it makes them feel different about the world, then they could change colors. To so, let's get to the next color. On the color wheel is blue. Blue is the color of logic and knowledge. knowledge. Blue sees the world through opportunity and the idea that anything is possible. The idea that everyone is born as a blank slate and has the potential to achieve anything they work for. Its magic reflects these things through mind manipulation, illusions, and the kinds of spells that can reveal truths, whether that involves finding hidden things or peeking through time. When extended beyond the base of expectation, Blue has the capacity to take free will away from others. This contradicts some of their philosophies, but like with all five colors, Blue is deep and complex not all of its philosophies exist at the same time in every character. With blue philosophy, it is expected that everything a being does is its own responsibility, and where you end up is a result of your own control. With its tabula rasa, or blank slate, ideology, it can become dispassionate and lack empathy when reflecting on the circumstances of the less fortunate. Blue's first trait we're going to talk about is nurture, or like I said several times, the blank slate self. As I said earlier, Blue believes in tabula rasa, or blank slate, which I've said like five times, but you gotta hammer it into your head, it's really important. Which means each person is born blank, and forms their potential through their choices and the things that happen to them. This plays into their focus on learning and acquiring skills. Sometimes this focus on potential change and improvement ends up ignoring traits that someone might have no control over. They would rather solely focus on the idea that any person with the proper access to technology and information, can accomplish the same things as anyone else who has the same exact access. A person can create anything, as long 
as they are willing to learn how. Speaking of creating anything, how about Geralf Sacchani? It's, I'm sure it's Italian, but I don't know how to say it. It's C-E-C-A-N-I. You tell me how to pronounce it in the comments, thanks. He's a stitcher from the plain of Innistrad who uses various body parts of dead things to create new life. He is a blue-aligned necromancer, preferring science over magic in order to raise the dead. These dead beings are called scobs. Geralf is a man of ingenuity and invention. He strives to learn something from each creation and often test them against his sister Gisa's risen hordes of zombies. For him, anything is possible, as long as you put your mind, or uh, the mind of many dead people, to it. Number two for blue is intelligence. For a blue mage, few things are more valuable than intelligence. For them, the ability to gather information and apply it is paramount. This philosophy generally refers to how much a given person knows and their ability to prove it. However, this can also relate to the differences in a person's experiences and how they've grown in response. If someone has internalized the events in their life into a working ideology that they can express and act upon, that is also something incredibly valuable. This is great when they see the potential in something that another color may overlook because of its unconventionality. Is that the real world? I don't know. Yet this focus on what someone knows can easily lead to elitism, where a blue character dismisses the worth of those it deems unintelligent. Who better than Gadwick the Wizard to exemplify this philosophy? On the plane of Eldraine, Gadwick is not technically the leader of Castle Vantress. However, he does take care of most responsibilities that the true leader, which is a massive key-shaped magic mirror, itself generally cannot do. The Knights of Vantress value knowledge, and uh, acquiring new knowledge, and the application of said knowledge to the challenges of the world. Gadwick is the Archmage of Vantress, and as such, he is looked up to by those aspiring to become a knight themselves. To become a knight on Vantress, you must tell that magic mirror a secret that it has never heard before. The mirror has the last say in whether you become a knight or not, and those hoping to become a knight search endlessly for knowledge known only to them, and soon to the mirror. The third thing about blue that you kind of want to know when going forward is that it really cares about reason or logic if you want to think of it that way. This is the ability to think through something in order to come to the best conclusion, whether through sheer logic or by conceding to those who do know better. I know it might seem like some of these philosophies are a little redundant, like duh, intelligence and reason, that's pretty close to the same thing, but allow me to use the absence of one of those to describe the blue philosophy of reason. <laughs> if a person is a master of reason, but lacks intelligence, it means that they know where and when to ask the right questions. They often do not know the answers or information themselves, but are adept at understanding where the holes in their knowledge and experience lie in order to find the people who could fill those gaps. Alternatively, one with intelligence that lacks reason might have memorized an entire library and be able to put that knowledge to proper use when needed. However, this person would have trouble teasing out the root of an issue or ever coming to the conclusion that there is a gap in their perspective that needs fill. A character who is heavily steeped in the reason part of blue philosophy may not always make choices that others see as good, but to them and to their values, the choice was always the reasonable. On the plane of Kamigawa, Azami Ozu was the head librarian of the greatest library on Kamigawa at the Minamo School. Many times throughout her life, she faced a difficult decision, and each one led her to the conclusion that knowledge is more important than the lives of those around her. When she was young, she believed that a river spirit was all-powerful, and made a pact with it so that she could give everything in the pursuit of knowledge. When her mother fell into this river, she got sick and she died. Azami believed that this was the price for her pact with that spirit. Later on, when she was attacked by the Nizumi when she was with her friend Atsumi, she faced the choice to either let her friend die or save some scrolls. She reasoned that the knowledge held by those scrolls was more important than her friend's life. Also, she purposely poisoned the old head librarian, Atsuko Shimazaki, I got it, got it, in order to take the position from her at the library. 
Azami's process of reasoning may not fall in line with our morals, but for her, it isn't about morals. It's about assessing the best outcome in adherence with the thing she values the most. She let her mom and her best friend die cause books. Books, dude. Cause books, dog. Next on our list of blue things, technology, like the things I'm looking at right now that I'm using. Nothing serves as a better example of the accomplishments of Blue philosophy than technology. Blue sees the understanding and application of technology as an extension of past knowledge. That a person can use the work of prior generations to further expand their capabilities. Most importantly, the invention of new technologies exemplifies Blue's focus on progress. Technology for Blue best illustrates their desire to continuously improve and innovate. That desire can be pushed to an extreme, though, where Blue becomes alienated from their origins. Where their desire to improve everything creates change beyond recognition or reversion. The example I'd like to use here is Tezzeret. For Tezzeret, a planeswalker from the Plain of Alara, technology is his conduit for life. It's how he sees the world and how he interacts with it. Starting in the lowly tide hollow of Esper, with parents who did not care for him, Tezzeret wasn't even born with a proper name. Tezzeret being a slang term for an improvised weapon. Ethereum, an aether-infused metal alloy, fascinated Tezzeret from a young age, leading to his future obsession with self-improvement and acquiring power through technology. His timeline of accomplishments can be directly tied to his greater mastery of different technologies, culminating in him merging the planar bridge with his own body, which would allow Nico Bolas to assault Ravnica with a mighty force of Eternals during the War of the Spark storyline. The next blue philosophy I'd like to talk about is preparedness. When a situation arises or a problem makes itself known, who is most likely to be prepared? Why? Blue characters are. Preparing for possible outcomes is essential to the blue-based mindset. Mechanics like Scry play into this idea very well, which allows you to look at the top card of your deck and put it on the bottom or leave it on the top. This helps you better prepare for the following turns by knowing which cards you're going to draw and manipulating which order you draw them in. There is a problem with preparedness if taken too far. It can create a paralysis of caution. If one is too involved with being ready for any possible future, they stop taking actions in the present. Jace Bellerin is a telemancer or a telepath who originates from the plane of Vryn. And uh, I'm just going to read straight from the wiki on this one. His telepathic powers allow him to manipulate enemy mages by countering their magic or using their spells against him. He is mostly self-taught as he has a habit of losing or deleting his own memory. An adept analyst, he has an optimized plan and a backup plan for every situation. Many times throughout Magic Story, Jace wipes his own memory in order to prepare for the event that someone else tries to read his mind. The key term for blue is potential. The inherent potential of every person to become anything. The potential to understand and the potential to answer any question. The potential for something to be created and the potential futures that one should be aware of. Everything in the universe has potential. Understanding, using, and building that potential is what blue is all about. The next color on the color pie is black. Black gets a bad rap always assumed to be the villain or the antagonist. Black philosophies play into that characterization more often than not, but that doesn't make black philosophy inherently evil or bad. The magic of black mana is that of death, disease, and necromancy. These things don't make a black mage a bad person. To them, it just means they're willing to do things that not everyone else would be willing to do. This can easily lead to villainous behavior, but sometimes it allows Black to see past social and societal norms in order to find a better solution than other colors would be able to. The first philosophy I'd like to talk about for Black is amorality. One of the pillars of Black magic involves the desecration of graves and the raising of the dead. And I can't stress this enough, this doesn't make them immediately evil. 
unless raising the dead is automatically evil to you. Many characters who practice necromancy do not see themselves as committing a vile act. To them, a person is already dead, so a dead body is just a resource. The amorality of Black hinges on the idea that they don't see the same things as wrong that others might. Sometimes this does make them do bad things and it can make them the bad guys. Other times, it just makes their choices kind of gray. The character may have murdered someone, but the person they murdered may have also been a bad guy. So to them, there was nothing wrong with murdering them. Characters that lean in this direction are more likely to commit crimes, lie, hurt others, and take any action necessary, regardless of the perceived right or wrong. The key to each character is why they do these amoral actions, and less about what they did. For Gonti, the lord of luxury, profit and enterprise are his main motivations. Gonti is a crime lord Aetherborn on the plain of Kaladesh. He runs a night market that services the renegades in the revolution against the consulate with illicit goods and siphoned aether. And while his deeds do assist the good guys, he's only in it for the money, and often he's kind of described as heartless. I really like black in magic because something that's really cool about... It's really cool to take something that has a perception to it, that's like everyone sees it as, oh, it's the bad guys because it's got the skull and like delve into how you create a good guy character out of the same philosophies while it still has those philosophies. It's really cool. The next philosophy of Black I'd like to talk about is individualism. Black is very concerned with the self, but in a different way than Blue. While Blue is preoccupied with self-improvement or proving oneself to others, Black is more about pleasing oneself and living life the way that one wants to live it. To Black, Cultivating one's own personality is an important trait, and the ability to live freely as whomever or whatever you want is valued highly for them. It's about finding out what is important to you, and what you want. Pursuing that, no matter what barriers appear. This focus on the self can lead characters to selfish tendencies, it makes them ignore the wants and needs of others in place of chasing their own dreams. None in the multiverse embody this more than the Aetherborn, like Gonti. Yep, we're doing two Kaladesh examples in a row, two Aetherborn in a row. The Aetherborn are creatures made from the byproducts of Aether refinement. They do not eat, nor do they sleep. However, they do live very short lives. Because of this, Aetherborn live in the moment, doing anything they can to find their part of the world and experience it to its fullest. Nothing is more important to an Aetherborn than enjoying the things that bring them joy. The things that make them who they are. According to the lore, what brings Gonti the most joy is collecting odd inventions and showing off his airships and construct menagerie. Ambition is a core part of black philosophy. If a black-based character has a goal in mind, they will do anything to reach it. It is the focus of their very being. Very often, an ambitious, philosophically black character will employ amoral tactics to achieve their goals. However, these ideas are not mutually inclusive. Characters can have large ambitions that encompass the entirety of their motivation without resorting to amoral behavior. You can still say that that character subscribes to black-based philosophy. As I mentioned earlier, not every character of a certain color will have all of the traits associated with their color. This will become very important to understand later on when we get into combining these colors. For now though, let's get to the example. Our example here is Yogmoth, the Thran Physician from the plane of Dominaria. He exemplifies this ideal to a terrifying degree. His story is long and deep, but I have a few pieces here that can help describe how he fits. If you are curious about this fascinating and ultimately horrific character, watch Spice 8 Rack's video on him. Yeah, oh man, and it's really fucking good. That video is very good, it's very long, it gets into racism territory, which of course it does, but uh, it's fantastic, it's so good, I love it. Anyway, Yogmoth discovered an artificial plane called Phyrexia, which we've mentioned a couple times previously. This began his unholy ambitions. He began large, with his will to become the god of this plane, and expanded into a goal of perfecting the mortals of Dominaria through mechanical and genetic alterations. And though he is currently dead in the story of magic, the influence of his ambitions ultimately led to the fall of the Plane of Myriad. He turned it into New Phyrexia, or Phyrexia II, the squeakquel, and 
generated the looming threat of Phyrexians across the whole multiverse. Another important philosophy for Black is exploitation. Exploitation in terms of Black philosophy is fairly simple to explain. There are many avenues to achieve one's goals in the universe. So many things that others may not think of or may not be willing to do. Black can raise the dead, exploiting the corpses of those that pass on. Black is willing to break the law, exploiting a lack of enforcement. Black will manipulate the will of others, exploiting their minds. Most other colors are not able to do these things, and if they are, they're not really willing to take it as far as Black will. Black philosophy is taking advantage of everything and everyone. Take the weak and vulnerable, for example. White would want to protect them. Blue might see them as lacking or as someone to improve. But Black sees them just as a tool to be used. The philosophy of exploitation can also apply to resourcefulness, using every part of something to gain the maximum advantage. Like a hunted animal, using every part of the deer. Sidisi, the tyrant of the Sultai brood, epitomizes exploitation. As a Khan on the plain of Tarkir, she allied with the demonic Rakshasas in order to gain necromantic power. In the altered timeline of Tarkir, where the ancient dragons were not wiped out, she never became Khan. However, as an undead slave, she threatened, killed, and spread rumors in order to keep her people, the Naga, in positions of power and influence. Her card in the new timeline even has the keyword ability, exploit. The vocab word for black philosophy is power. The desire for power and the willingness to do anything to achieve it. The empowering of oneself, putting personal interests first. The drive that compels you to stop at nothing in the name of your goals. That anything can be a resource in accomplishing those goals. Having and acquiring power, whatever that means to the specific character, is the name of the game for black. The next color on this wheel, ding, da, da, you know, the joke, whatever, who cares, is red. The color of fire and lightning, mountains and dragons and giants. Red has fury and passion. It feels emotions stronger than any other color and lets those emotions lead it. Sometimes this can be wonderful in the ways red characters express themselves. Other times it can lead to irrational actions with grave consequences. A red character can be compassionate and loving, but they can also be hateful and vengeance. The first philosophy we're going to talk about with red is impulsiveness. Impulsivity is a key trait of red, acting on one's emotions in the spur of the moment, without a second thought. It allows them to be quick and ready, at any second something could happen and red would know to follow its heart. It is incredibly useful for accomplishing tasks quickly, but it can easily lead to a mistake and a misunderstanding. Chandra Nalar is the most impulsive character to embrace the halls of magic story. She is a pansexual hot mess that jumps into things headfirst without thinking of the consequences. She has been known to get herself and her friends in trouble when acting without thinking. Easily swayed on her emotions, Chandra was once convinced to chase after Dovin Bond and kill him rather than think of a rational plan to save her mother. This led to her and Nyssa being captured in the deadline trap. Yeah. The second thing I'm going to talk about with Red is hedonism. The ideology of pleasure. Seeking the things that makes you happy and feel good. This can be fulfilling and even lead to overall happiness for those around red characters, like musicians and artists. However, in the search for pleasure, one can find themselves lost, abandoning the rest of the world. When red embraces hedonism, it can become blind to harm it's doing. Kari Zev is a skyship raider, and after being expelled from her artificer apprenticeship, she ran away. She returned as a sky pirate with a pet monkey that only plays by her own rules. She lives for adventure and danger, happy to pursue whatever finds her fancy in her skyship named the Dragon Smile. The next trait we're going to talk about for Red is compassion. White may have the monopoly on protecting the weak and helping the poor, but no other color truly cares for others like Red. Red forms bonds of loyalty and trust stronger than anyone. This comes from Red's ability to relate and understand people emotionally. Red will listen to your problems. Red will always be in your corner fighting for you. Because Red really cares about the others around him. I don't have a downside for this philosophy. It's just a good thing. We should all be compassionate. I'm not sure if I have a specific character in mind for this trait of red, so instead I'd like to suggest a short story from the magic team about Alesha, who smiles at death. I mean Alicia. I always say it. It is a fantastic tale about the first trans woman character in magic. I'm sure there's some connection with the uh, compassion, wink wink, that I could make here. Could you pause it? Because I'm gonna fucking die. Our next trait for red is disobedience. 
rules aren't really Red's thing. Unless those rules were created by the person themselves, they are seen more as suggestions. This gives Red a distinct sense of inner justice and a knack for seeing the flaws in governmental structures. However, this can also spur Red to commit crimes just to spite authority. Grenzo is a goblin on the plain of Fiora who started as a dungeon warden, but was fired from that position when a new queen came to power. Since then, he has been a leader of a thieving gang that incites mobs to violence as a way to get back at the authority and also the Artificer Museum. The next thing we're going to talk about for Red is pretty important. It's emotions or expression. The emotions of Red are often shown as anger through the cards. This is because the game of Magic is about combat, and anger is the most practical combat emotion. However, the extent of Red's emotional expression is large and wide. Love, hate, sadness, joy, passion, and regret. Red believes in feeling emotions to their fullest, that expressing what one feels is the only catharsis, even if that means giving in to the sadness from time to time. Felden of the Third Path was an archaeologist during the Brothers' War on Dominaria. The Third Path was a group that didn't want to take sides during this war. While with this group, Felden fell in love with a woman named Loran. However, when Teresia City was assaulted by Mishra, one of the brothers, Loran was captured and tortured for the Golgothian silence. Long story short, they succeeded, activated the silex, and caused an ice age. Red is the color of freedom more than anything. Red believes in following one's heart and expressing oneself. Fighting crime by doing crimes and saying fuck you to the man. Red wants everyone to be who they are and follow their dreams. If that guy made you mad, punch him in the mouth. If you think that person is cute, let him know. If you don't want to follow the rules, well shit, don't. Red believes you can't fight in a coliseum if you ain't cute. Okay. <sighs> Last one. We got one more color on this dag wheel that I keep pointing to that I don't see because it's a green screen. Speaking of a green screen, the next color is green. Plants and animals, the wilds, the forests, and the great unknown, green is known for its natural magic, its beasts, and its use of instincts. It is generally very in tune with who it is. It understands its place in the world and how it fits in. However, green is vehemently against the unnatural and the exploitation of the natural order. It believes you are born into your purpose and that you cannot change that. So, the first thing we're going to talk about for green is instinct. Green has intuition that is unmatched. Green values the ability to react quickly and do what comes naturally. Eat, sleep, reproduce, etc. Green sees that nature has taken its course over millennia in order to create what you are now. Why fight it? Your motivation in life is inherently given to you, and following them will fulfill you more than any other pursuit. Or so Green believes. Goreclaw, the terror of Calcisma, is a wild bear. She follows her instincts, protecting what she sees as her territory, a place in the high forests of the mountains of the plain of Tarkir. By surviving long enough on instinct alone, she has grown to the size of a dragon. The next thing we're going to talk about for Green is interdependence. Everything is connected. Green philosophy dictates that we should all have our place in the grand scheme. Nothing is more honorable and desirable than finding one's place and serving one's role perfectly. If everyone was playing their part properly, the whole world would work in harmony. This gives Green a sense of community, but can easily skew until Green denies the potential of others. Green is quick to dismiss someone who steps out of line, believing that we don't choose who we are. We must instead embrace the roles given to us. No! Why did it do that? Since my teleprompter cut off this part of my script for some reason, I'm going to read it from my phone, sorry about that. So the character example I'm using for interdependence is Marwyn the Nurturer. She is an elf druid of Lanawar. The most prominent... Kelfe? Is that how you say it? I don't fuck it. The most prominent Kelfe midwife and a leader taking pride in welcoming in new citizens into her domain. She famously negotiated a treaty with an angry group of elves from another Elfheim while at the bedside of a mother going through a difficult birth. In the end, Marwyn handed the newborn child to the opposing leader and ordered him to keep the child warm while she tended to the mother. The Kelfe are an Elfheim on Dominaria where Kavu and elves are born together and work symbiotically. The next thingy, and I'm just gonna say next for everything because I forgot what the numbers are, is nature. Obviously, green, nature, whatever. But what I mean here is inherent self. So nature versus nurture, this is the nature side. The idea that who you are is more influenced by genetics and who birthed you than any choice of your own or things you've experienced. 
a person is more suited to following their nature than trying to change it. This is a very common stance among green characters, but I had trouble finding a good specific example. So just imagine what I said about blue with nurture, but like, the opposite. The next thing is something I added specifically, and I didn't see anyone else really talking about this for green, but it's history. Philosophically, green is always looking at what came before, seeking truth and experiences and knowledge of elders and ancients. Looking to the past in search of answers is a very green thing. Rather than theorize about the future, green prefers to focus on things that have already happened. Additionally, green believes in keeping history alive and known, whether through written history or oral tradition. The tales of their ancestors inform the lives that they lead in the present. Reki, the history of Kamigawa, is a monk on the plain of Kamigawa whose tattoos tell the tales of ancient Kamigawa. After his death, other monks spent ten years transcribing the tattoos and gathering stories from those who spoke with him. Thus, the book, The History of Kamigawa, was written. The next thing is preservation. To Green, things are the way they are for a reason. Keeping things sacred is important to Green philosophy. The way of the wild and the life therein is worth safekeeping. To Green, preserving life and culture is incredibly important. Nothing should be forgotten, not even the littlest things. The way things are should be maintained for the sake of those that came before, so that those who come next will know about it. Okay, here we go, again, it took it off my thing, so I gotta read it from my phone, but it's fine, it's a video, who cares? Titania, the protector of Argoth, was a Maro sorcerer for the lush forests of Argoth, on the plain of Dominaria which was attacked by both sides for supplies during the end of the Brothers' War. By some, she was considered to be a goddess. She was weakened due to the excessive plundering of the forest by the Brothers' armies. She tried to negotiate with both brothers, but they wouldn't leave. She then led a permanent offensive against both armies in hopes of protecting Argoth. If you take all these philosophies and smash them into one concept, you'll get the green ideal of heritage, preserving what centuries have created, Keeping track of one's history, Green sees a being's place in the world as its inheritance, and rising to the call of their nature is more important than anything. Green says that your heritage will lead you on the right track and tell you everything you need, and tell you everything you need to know about the world. Okay, so I took way too long explaining each of the colors and their traits, but I really needed you all to get a good picture of what we're working with here before we get started on the true purpose of this video. So let's zoom through this next part. It's only like 20 sections long, no big deal. Now, let's get weird by combining some of these ideas into hybrid monstrosities of philosophy. Let's take a look at the color pie once more, shall we? Philosophically, colors next to each other on the pie have enough in common to be allies. Colors opposite from each other have enough problems with one another to be enemies. When referring to the pairs of colors, players will often talk about the allied and enemy color pairs. There are five of each, and these pairs do way more than just describe mechanical combinations. Just like the colors by themselves, color pairs represent the combination of each color's philosophies. So we'll start with green and white. Also known as Selesnia, these colors, when combined, focus on the thing they both share the most concern for, and that is community. Green-white is characterized by a sense of duty to the greater good, what will benefit the most people rather than the few. Trostani Selesnia's voice is the guild leader of the Selesnia Conclave on the Plain of Ravnica. They are three dryads who used to be separate people that combined into one. They consistently advocate for the actions that will benefit the whole of the Conclave. The next one is white-blue, also known as Azorius. The concept of structure is what binds these two colors rules and processes that can tell anyone what they are supposed to do in any given situation. If there is a crime, they have a punishment for it. If there is a choice, they have the proper channels to set aside by which you can make that choice. If white is law, then blue is order. Okay, I'm gonna have to do this a lot in this video it looks like, but I don't have time to fuck with this program, so let's go. Brago, King Eternal, was born third son to a minor house. The ambitious young Count Brago worked himself upwards in the ruling class of the Plain of Fiora. He was a terror in the courts and council chambers, his arguments flawless, his entreatments irresistible. He built up a coalition of nobility, clergy, and the merchant class, and rooted out corruption and replaced it with humility. The next color combination is blue-black, also known as Demir. The main trait blue and black have in common is self-improvement, becoming stronger, more powerful, and more knowledgeable through any means necessary. It is a self-centered approach to advancement and accomplishment. No! Please, please, my, all of them are gone! 
Rona, disciple of Gix, is a human follower of Gix. She trained in the Talarian magic on Dominaria. She has she has a biomechanical eye and modified her body to transcend her human form. It's a black blue thing to use technology to modify your body and make you more powerful, okay? That's what Rona did, since I don't have it on here. Next color combination, black red. Also known as Rakdos, the largest thing they have in common is their focus on independence. The idea that one should only be beholden to themselves and be free to make their choices based on their own whims. Nothing should hold any person back from the things they want to do and the things they feel with no dependence on anyone else. I'm mad because my thing's gone again. Oh! Olivia Voldaren was in life a beautiful but strange hermetic antisocial woman who preferred to live far away from human civilization in manor homes built for her from seemingly boundless wealth. Like her, Boldaran vampires tend to live in distant places such as the borderlands and edges of Innistrad's provinces. Olivia travels often visiting far-flung Voldaran manors and fortresses that are scattered across the four provinces of Innistrad. The elite among vampires know that Olivia throws the best parties and the nobility will be happy to make the trek to the estate to see her seasonal ball. She is a famous eccentric and bon vivant. Actually, this I didn't write that part. I don't know what that is. She has keen interest in watching Cathars lose their faith right before their demise. The next color combination, red-green, also known as gruel. Green and red have one major commonality and it is authenticity. Being true to oneself and following their beliefs unflinchingly. Never, falter never faltering in conviction that comes from within. Whether that is instinctual or emotional, gruel is straightforward when showing itself to the world. Galia of the Endless Dance. Hey, check it out. It's on there. I don't have to use my phone. She is an infamous female satyr and a self-styled Lord of Misrule. She wears bright flowers wound around her horns and carries a mock scepter topped with a goblet. She is fickle and loves novelty, and her main goal is to hold a never-ending party. All right, enemy philosophies. Those were the allied ones, if I didn't say that. Enemy color philosophies are much harder than allied ones. So, first one, green-blue also known as Simic, the main conflict of green and blue is nature versus nurture, which I've said a billion times in this video. Where this conflict comes together, where this conflict comes together is the aim of the debate itself, to find the truth. In that, they can be known as the colors of truth-seeking. So there we go. So we're going to talk about Krufix. Krufix, the god of horizons, is the eldest god on Theros. The enigmatic god has dominion over the potential, the distant, and the unseen. Thus, he is seen as an oracle of dreams. He also governs navigation, mystery, and the circles of time, and is the keeper of mysteries that are no others are meant to learn. Fun fact, of all the gods on Theros, Krufix is the only one that knows about other planes. Next one. I'm just going to hold this in my hand because I'm probably going to need it. Next one is Green Black, also known as Golgari. The main conflict here is preservation of versus exploitation. I've seen online many conclude that this conflict creates profanity, but I disagree with that. Rather, I see the combination of these ideas as resourcefulness. Preserving nature requires resourcefulness. Exploiting dead bodies also requires resourcefulness. The character example I'm using here is Izoni Thousand Eyes because of course it's not on the teleprompter. Why would it be? Izoni Thousand Eye is known for her ability to control insects and spiders. She has never encountered without the company of one or more swarms of insects crawling all over and around her. This gives her a connection to vessels of decomposition, the symbol for life and death in a cycle. The next one, red-white, which uh, I have called heroism or vigilantism. Also known as Boros, the main conflict here is between the two, law and freedom. When combined, you have someone who believes in law and justice, but doesn't believe that they should hold back someone from doing what's right. Thus, we get heroism and vigilantism. It's on the phone again. Let's do it. I'm not mad. Adriana Valor was the captain of the guard under King Brago, who I mentioned earlier. She took his sword after his death and quit her job on the day of Queen Marchesa's coronation. The new queen overthrew the troops that Adriana had originally commanded in favor of ones that were only loyal to the queen. This led Adriana to begin a plot to overthrow the monarchy of the city of Paliana and build a new republic. Okay, the next enemy color combination is white and black, which I have called tribalism. Also known as Orzhov, the main conflict between white and black is collectivism versus individualism. Something fairly interesting happens when these ideologies meet halfway, and by interesting, I mean horrible. Tribalism also goes by another term, racism. When you believe that you are the most important thing, anyone who you see is similar enough to you gets put into your in-group. 
When you believe in protecting your in-group at the detriment of any others, that is what White Black is. Thankfully, the character thing is on my screen, so hoo-ha! The character I'm choosing is Soren Markov, a vampire planeswalker from the Plain of Innistrad. He created an angel to protect the humans of Innistrad. Her name was Avacyn. She's dope. I mentioned her earlier. I told you that we'd be back to her story. And even though Avacyn believed in the humans and wants to keep them safe, her creator Soren had other ideas. Soren needed Avacyn to keep the monsters of Innistrad from overfeeding on the humans, causing them to go extinct, which would in turn cause his race, the vampires, to go extinct. Soren only protects the humans so that his people won't starve. He doesn't truly care about the well-being of the humans. Blue-Red is our next combination, and it's creativity. Also known as Is It, the main conflict of Blue-Red is reason versus emotion. However, these two can combine fairly easily compared to other ones. Using emotion to guide progress and development leads to the creative process. Red-Blue philosophy is all about approaching things unconventionally, learning and advancing through passion and whimsy. Ludwig, necro-alchemist, lives in Havengul on the plain of Innistrad. In his veritable studies of necroalchemy, dogs bark at me. I mean, what can you do, really, to be honest with you? <laughs> Ludwig, the necroalchemist, lives in Havengul on the plain of Innistrad. In his veritable studies of necroalchemy, Ludwig aims for more than simply the creation of scobs or true life. Like so many of his colleagues, instead, he also aims to understand the horror his creations inspire. Some think that Ludwig's consumption of potions and inhalation of toxic vapors has led him no choice but to abandon his experiments. Did you get all that? If not, that's okay. I have a handy little shortcut understanding of the philosophies. By taking one singular issue and seeing how each color and color combination would justify, or choose to express it, we can understand them all better. On Reddit, by user Josephedia, look, or Josephisha, I'm so sorry about that one, there is this nifty chart of the different colors and gills on being trans. There, now that you understand each color and how they combine together, we can go further. Three color combination philosophy, I got this! In order to understand tricolor philosophy, we need to see what all three colors have against the two colors they exclude. So. First off, we're going to start with green, white, blue, also known as Bant. What's missing from them is red and black, or independence, as I said earlier. This means that Bant is all about the intersection of community and interdependence in decision-making in life. Bant characters all depend on one another in order to understand their place in the world. I have an example! God damn it! Upon being spawned on the plain of Dominaria, Arcades Sabbath lost interest in all other Elder Dragons being born and went to investigate interesting human structures in the distance. He became fascinated by human society. He took up residence in a ring fort where the humans worshipped him as their dragon lord. In return, he taught them a better path of life, one ruled not just by their own primitive violent tendencies. Under the reign of Arcades, their realm dwelt in peace and order. The next one we've got is white, blue, black. Also called Esper, it holds its differences in green-red, green-red being the combination of authenticity. And wouldn't you know it, the shard on the planet of Lara that represents Esper is a place of robotics and ethereum body augmentation. Philosophically, Esper characters are inherently deceptive and value manipulation. They are willing to pretend to be someone or something else in order to accomplish their goals. The character we got here is called Yannette, a sphinx from an unspecified plane, so we don't know where she's from actually. Unlike most sphinxes from other planes, Yannette sees power in knowledge. She has used her own knowledge to rise to power and become a queen. She has powerful magic that is said to be able to snatch moments from the future and pull them to the present. The next philosophy, blue, black, red, also called Grixis. This combination is missing the white and green philosophy of community. That means that those that abide by Grixis ideals believe every person for themselves. They believe that no one is there to help you without wanting something in return, and that you should always be looking for personal gain in any scenario. Hey look, it's on the thing. I'm gonna keep pointing it out, because this is really annoying. Nico Bolas is one of the main villains in Magic the Gathering. Known for his ability to control the minds of others, Bolas only serves one master, himself. His schemes and deeds have affected the lives of billions across the multiverse and manipulated many others in his service for personal empowerment. Next one. Black, green, red. 
also known as Jund, when together, these three colors deny the qualities of white, blue, or structure. This means that Jund is all about chaos, disorder, and lawlessness. One might be tempted to say anarchy, but as we'll get into later, anarchy is not about disorder and chaos, as you may have been led to believe. Jun doesn't believe in any rules except might. If you want something done, do it yourself. If you think something should be done different, change it yourself. This may seem a lot like Grixis, and that's because it's kind of similar. They both share black and red. The main difference can be summed up in two phrases. Grixis believes that there is no correct way to live, and Jun believes the correct way to live is through chaos. Kresh the Blood Braided was the mightiest human warrior on the Jun Shard on the Plain of Alara. Wielding a sword called the Mage Slayer, he commanded respect and honor in the bloodshed of battle. Jund warriors wear braids in their hair, tied with skin and tendons from fallen foes. Most great warriors have about two to five braids, but Kresh had 22 by the age of 30. On Jund, there is no rule but battle and ferocity. Next, we have white, green, red, also known as Naya. These colors lack black and blue, or the quality of self-improvement. The Naya are fairly primitive and often see technology as losing one's connection to nature. The interconnectivity and community of, na of the natural is seen as important, and the idea that one would attempt to stand above the rest and assert their power over others is a betrayal of Nayan ideals. Marisi, breaker of the coil from Naya on the plane of Alara, called upon his fellow Leonin to revolt against the empire of the clouds and the structures of the coil. A great civil war broke out. The white wall that had housed the coil was broken, and the race split in two. The prides who followed Marisi's beliefs, calling themselves Wild Nakatals, broke free from that structured civilization and celebrated their animal natures, marching down out of the cloudy mountain peaks and into the jungle once more. Black, white, and green, also known as Abzan, goes without the creativity of red and blue. Instead, it is stagnated and focuses on the circle of life and death, and the repetitive perfection of that cycle. However, what it lacks in creativity and newness, it makes up for in resilience, historicity, and immortality. Whether through enduring and imposing architecture or literal eternal life, Abzan is all about lasting through the ages. Our example is Karador, the ghost chieftain. He was once a high war chief of the Centaur tribe, but was slain in a great battle. Now he haunts the valleys of his birthplace as a bitter king with wraiths and shades at his side. He gathers ghostly minions for an assault on the rival war chief who deposed him. White, black, and red, also known as Mardu, is missing the truth-seeking nature of green blue. This makes them incurious. Mardu is sure of itself, staying true from beginning to end. Alicia, the character we talked about in the red section, was a con of the Mardu on the plain of Tarkir. She knew who she was. Mardu does not believe that there is deeper secrets worth wasting life on. To Mardu, the causes worth fighting for are always obvious and always direct. It is the quickest to jump to conflict, for that is where purpose resides. Mathis is a vampire who hunts vampires and is from an unknown planet. His desire to be the only one of his kind drives him to betray his brethren. He hunts his fellow vampires and brands them with a powerful holy symbol, condemning them to death. Mathis keeps his true identity secret, playing the part of the innocent mortal, but with every death he becomes a step closer to the time he will finally be able to unleash his true hunger upon the world. Next one is blue, black, and green. Also known as soul tie, it lacks the conviction, honor, and emotion of red white. There are no heroes, and no one who believes in justice. Right and wrong are illusions to Sultai. Sultai believes that survival is all that matters, whether through manipulation or natural means. Morality, loyalty, and compassion are useless to Sultai. Leovold's latest posting was the high city of Pagliano on the plain of Fior. He was making his presence known in the city by hosting elaborate parties, banquets, and other displays with the express intent of cultural exchange. He was known for his grand gestures and bold proclamations of friendship, but secretly, he gathered intelligence on all notable citizens. He would exchange what he had collected with the right people for the right price. Next one we got is White Blue Red, also known as Jeskai. It has lost its connection with the baser instincts and natural resourcefulness that comes with black and green. It is expressive, but in a focused way. 
Jeskai is very political and deeply concerned with the workings of society. It wants everyone to live freely, but in an orderly and civil way. Jeskai is very artistic, with practiced methods like music and painting, which require skill and training, but still are very expressive. Savine, the chronoclasm, was a human chronoch from the plane of Dominaria, with a taste for adventure and a love of exploration. After being trained in the Telerian Academy in temporal magic, he grew restless with book learning and left to roam the world as he soon had gained his wizard's mantle. As a gifted sorcerer, with an encyclopedic knowledge of the arcane arts, he relies on his magical prowess to aid him in his escapades across Dominaria. Blue, red, and green, also known as Teemer, lacks the tribalism of black and white. It does not see in or out groups. Teemer revels in discovery and anything new, while black and white is afraid of things that it does not understand. Teemer is excited by the unknown. It does not bother with structure and order. Instead, it indulges in the chase. It wants to be on the move at all times. There's always something new to see and experience. Riku, of two reflections, has always had two different passions, the study of spellcraft and the study of life. The mage could never really choose between them, and unfortunately he had no time to master both. So, he managed to find the solution to his dilemma through an ancient illusionist spell. He secretly split himself into two reflections, and each Riku trained and studied for years in their chosen fields. Today, Riku is regarded as a master wizard of both disciplines, and few know his secrets. The two reflections never stray far from each other, and when danger threatens, enemies must face both Rikus at the same time. So, I heard you thought that I couldn't do four color philosophies, but let me tell you how wrong you are. Four color philosophies, let's go. <laughs> Basically, four color philosophies are a lot like the three color philosophies, where you look at what's missing to understand their ideals. Only this time, there's only just a single color missing. There are so few cards that represent these four colors in magic, but luckily Wizards of the Coast did release a set of five legends that represent four colors. So we're just gonna use those the best we can. First one we got, blue, black, red, green. Since this combination is missing the color white, it is devoid of white qualities. This means they are without law, order, and equality, a philosophy of strength, where the goal is to prove oneself greater than the rest in any way possible. The power of chaos mixed with the motivation of ambition. Yidris, the Maelstrom Wielder, is the legend of these colors. Born on the Grixis Shard of Alara, Yidris is one of the incurables, afflicted with an unstable mutation that threatens to shatter his mind. Though he was a mage, there was no magic that could relieve his curse, and Yidris resigned himself to this fate. During the conflicts, Grixis collided with the other shards, and the shattered plane of Alara was made whole again. Knights from Bant drove Yidris directly into the Maelstrom, a volatile storm of raw mana at the plane's center. The unpredictable power of the Maelstrom stabilized Yidris' mutations, making the ogre a conduit for its own chaos. The next four color combination we have is white, black, red, green. Devoid of blue ideals like logic, reason, and technology, this color combination values the past and takes actions to honor its heritage in the present. This philosophy is not about waiting or planning. However, its respect for tradition arranges an order of operations for its priorities. Incredibly prone to revenge, the idea that one's ancestors are watching would be common for characters who follow this doctrine. For example, Saskia the Unwielding is a human from an unknown plane. She was the sole survivor of a massacre conducted against her village by an invading army that came from across the sea. The warrior tradition of her people demands for the survivors of a battle to erect monuments of stones for the fallen, a task Saskia worked at in solitude for almost ten years. As news of her labor spread among her people, thousands of warriors journeyed to see Saskia place the final stone upon the symbol of defiance. With the monument complete, her mind turned from mourning to vengeance. With axe in hand and a host at her back, Saskia brought war to the doorstep of her enemy. Next we've got white, blue, red, green. Without black, this philosophy is the opposite of selfish. Ambition and power is far from the minds of characters with this philosophy. They would rather the world live in peace and harmony together with freedom to express and love however they choose. Rebels and freedom fighters epitomize the color combination, but so do lovers and storytellers. Like many of the three color combinations, this philosophy detests concentrated power, especially the tyrannical. Kineos and Tiro of Melitus were human soldiers from the plane of Theros. 
In the age of antiquity, the humans of the region that would one day become Melodus, the largest polis on Theros, were ruled by the tyrant... I'm gonna butcher this name. Agnomakos. Actually, I don't think I did butcher it, although he is a butcher. An immortal archon. Unchecked for generations, his power grew as he carved out a mighty empire. Kinaios and Tiro, joined by their love for one another and for freedom, rose to challenge him. The people rallied to their cause, and Agnumakos was defeated. The legend says that the god Ephara granted the humans magic to help them overthrow the Archon and cast out his Leonin guard. The polis of Melitus was founded on the ruins of Agno... Agnumakos empire as a beacon of freedom and enlightenment and its people chose Kianos and Tiro to be its guardians. The two two great statues were built in their honor. Holy fuck me, this is so hard. The next fourth <laughs> thing is white, blue, black, and green. Red is the missing piece in this philosophy and that means it has no emotions and no compassion. The ideal of waiting, learning, progressing, and taking advantage. Learning from the past in order to perfect the future. Perfection is the key here. Perfecting nature, perfecting evolution, perfecting knowledge, perfecting technology. Everything can be made better. Atraxa, the Praetor's voice, is an angel horror from the plane of New Phyrexia, or what used to be Mirin. Once a Mirin angel who opposed the Phyrexian's corruption, Atraxa was captured while single-handedly protecting a Mirin retreat. The Praetor Elish Dorn honored the angel's tenacity with the blessed gift of Phyrexian completion, spelling right here and invited other Praetors to contribute. While Urbrask, the Red One, declined, Jin Cataxius, Sheldred, and Vornclex all agreed to join Elish Norn's efforts, and Atraxa was born, an awe-inspiring testament to Phyrexian's singular purpose. The next one we have is white, blue, black, and red, which means no green. No green means no respect for nature and what came before. The idea that there is a path to one's goals even when others cannot see it whether through unconventional means or through inventing completely new means by which to succeed. Processes and structure are valuable, but sometimes they must be bent to a person's will. This philosophy focuses on the idea of great people that can inspire the world. Our character example is Brea, the Ethereum Shaper. She is a human from the plane of Alara, her native shard of Esper, is driven by the noble work an effort to augment all living things with an aether-infused alloy called Ethereum. The Esperites believed Alara's Ethereum supply was finite because no one could create it, but after the shards of Alara were reunited during the event, Brea has proven them wrong. While exploring Jund, Brea discovered Karmut, a redstone necessary for creating Ethereum that did not exist on Esper. Brea replaced the majority of her organic body with Ethereum that she created herself. Soon after, Brea realized that the wild magic of Jun had influenced her metal, granting her powerful new abilities, which is how she got the color red. So we got through all the color combinations. That's all of them, right? Whoa! What did you think? What did you think? That I wasn't going to do the five color combinations? You think I'm that weak? That I can't handle it? That I don't know about five color philosophies? You're dead wrong. It's happening right now. Let's go. White, blue, black, red. Green, the Wooburg, the whole color pie. Your first instinct might be to say omniscience or omnipotence, gods and great ones. And at first, magic kind of seems to agree with you, with characters like Child of Alara, Horde of Notions, Corona the False God, Progenitus, Okagachi, and a multitude of Sliver Queens, Lords, and Legions. These are intense and formidable creatures that are often immortal and unkillable. But I wasn't asking about their status of power, I wanted to understand their philosophy the philosophy of five colors, and it isn't just everything mixed together. Rather, I see five color philosophy as someone who can understand all of perspectives, someone who can work from any starting point and discern how another person would reach the conclusion that they do. It isn't about being all powerful, even if most of the cards representing it are essentially that. It's about ultimate empathy. I don't mean kindness and compassion, I mean the ability to see anything from someone else's point of view including evil and unfeeling things. The ability to understand monsters and killers, thieves and manipulators, as well as kings, nobles, wizards, and knights. Characters in this philosophy see the value in every way of life and generally believe that there's a balance to be upheld in the universe. Five color philosophies can be more than that though. It can mean a sort of ascension of philosophy. 
I believe that this is what the creatives at Magic HQ usually go for, characters who live beyond the ideals of lower life forms. The problem is, this kind of thinking isn't applicable to the real world, and is only useful in describing what is essentially a god, with plans and motivations incomprehensible to mortals. Though, their Lovecraftian eldritch beasts in Magic are colorless rather than five colors, so who knows? In the real world, five color philosophy is more likely to be an understanding of all philosophies and perspectives, and not an adherence to all at once. A person who can take any direction and truly know what it takes to be a part of that community. I don't have a good example of a five color character in Magic that would help my case, and I think there's a reason for that. I don't believe that those creating characters are very good at creating things that adhere philosophically to five colors. They make characters who mechanically, you know, gameplay wise, work well at five colors, but not ones who feel like they subscribe to all five philosophical ideals. So instead, I'd like to take a character from another piece of media, Will Graham from the Hannibal TV show and books. I also understand it's difficult for you to be social. Well, I'm just talking at them, I'm not listening to them, it's, it's not social. But you can empathize with narcissists and sociopaths. I can empathize with anybody. He is what they call pure empathy. In that story, he uses this to be able to tap into the motivations and perspectives of serial killers to help the police solve cases. While Will may not be a five-color character inherently, when he taps into that pure empathy, he becomes five-color. He walks into another person's shoes despite the experiences he's had himself in life. He's able to understand the hearts of some of the worst humans who have committed some of the worst, most horrendous crimes. This isn't just a logical cause and effect sort of thing. He can feel why they do it. He can relate to them in ways a simple analyst couldn't. All right, now the moment you've all been waiting for, here we go. Six color philosophies, here we go, you knew it. There's a secret color that no one told you about. The real purpose of this video, even though I just spent like, talking about the philosophies is to use the color pie and apply it to real world philosophies, ideals, governments, and dispositions. We're just going to explore the following list, but you can use these colors to describe almost anything you want. If you feel like you have a good grasp on the philosophies, go ahead and try it. What color combinations would you say best suits you? How would you describe your country? Horrible. The leader in your country? Worse. What about your political stance? Pretty dope. There are a ton of things to explore this way, but we're just going to focus on these 20 things. Most of these definitions that I'm going to use for this stuff comes from either Merriam-Webster or Wikipedia. It's not perfect, but for the purposes of this video, they'll have to do. If you feel one of these philosophies should be defined differently, just let me know in the comments. The first one we're going to start off with, of course, is fascism. We'll define fascism as a political philosophy, movement, or regime that exalts nation and often race above the individual, and that stands for a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader, severe economic and social regimentation, and forcible suppression of opposition. For the color pie, this ideology has a clear in-group, out-group mentality, so it has to have some sort of black and white simultaneously to get that good old tribalism we talked about earlier. However, the fanaticism and hero worship that comes with fascism leads me to think of the heroism of red-white. It fits here very well. The idea that a leader of a fascist movement would have all the answers and can solve the nation's problems by themselves, it really fits that red-white philosophy. The oppressive attitudes that define fascism can be described as very white, and as much as I hate to say it, because red-white-black is my favorite color combination in Magic, fascism does feel very Mardu. As though all the darker aspects of these colors combined into one group that negates all of the positives. That would be fascism. You can really see how the color philosophies cover wide spectrums when you look at that. Like, there can be two separate Mardus in the real world, where you have fascism or you have these freedom-loving dudes. It's really interesting, as what I have mentioned here doesn't exactly sound like the description I gave of Mardu earlier in the video. You can even add green to this philosophy since using heritage as a symbol of purity is often a key tool of fascism. The next philosophy or government structure that we're going to talk about is monarchism. It has a very short definition that we're going to go with. It's undivided rule or absolute sovereignty by a single person. I think that you could have a lot of different definitions for monarchism here, like blood lines are often involved, but for the purposes of this philosophy, just think about it that way. 
The color pie of monarchism is very complex because it involves negating parts of the colors that represent it. For example, the centering of authority around a single family or person is not always white, but it can be often seen that way when white forgoes its values of equality. The structure and governance of monarchism are very white. We will find that many of the governing philosophies here have some amount of white in their color pie because of this structure aspect. For monarchism, it has a lot of white philosophical features except for that equality aspect. However, you will find that a large number of monarchs in the magic universe have that white leaning even without the equality aspect. I would say that if we take monarchism in the abstract and attempt to match magic philosophy to it, we would arrive mostly at white ideology, missing the small equality part like I said earlier, and replacing it, possibly, with green. The idea that each person is born into their status in life. So, I guess you could say, monarchism is green-white. But sometimes it's just mono-white. The next philosophy we're going to talk about is conservatism. Conservatism we define as a political philosophy based on tradition and social stability, stressing established institutions, and preferred gradual development to abrupt change. A disposition in politics to preserve what is established. The color pie of conservatism. Right off the bat, conservatism, it comes from the word conserve, so it reads as green. They want to keep things as they are. They don't want to ruin the things that are already established. Green believes in honoring the past and keeping it sacred. Conservatism believes in keeping things like they used to be, or making it great again. You know, like it was before, when it was good. Yeah. <laughs> conservatism is a straight green ideology with no other colors for the most part. The next ideology you want to talk about is neoliberalism. We're going to define it as the 20th century resurgence of 19th century ideas associated with laissez-faire economic liberalism and free market capitalism. It is generally associated with the policies of economic liberalization including privatization, deregulation, globalization, free trade, austerity, and the reductions in government spending in order to increase the role of the private sector in the economy and society. Sorry, <laughs> fumble. So with the color pie, first off, it's a bit of a word soup, but let me simplify it a little bit. This has a focus on philosophical individualism, which is a blue trait, but it also has an emphasis on giving the systems in place, i.e. capitalism, more freedom to do what they want. Deregulation is in opposition to white, so it can't be that. It is misleading to say that the freedom quote of neoliberalism is red, since it doesn't actually refer to individual freedoms, rather individual responsibility. So it wouldn't be red. Instead, I would see it as a sort of blue-black ideology. It's one that believes in freedom for powerful entities and the removal of safety nets in lieu of austerity measures. The next one we will talk about is capitalism. We're going to define it as a parasitic system doomed to kill us all. Or, uh, I mean, an economic system based on private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit. Those owning the means of production have sole decision-making power on things like price, production, and labor wage. The color pie of capitalism is pretty simple. It's black. Straight black philosophy. Individuals with concentration of power operating for personal or company-based profits. No matter the exploitation of the workers or the alienation that that brings, it's a black philosophical perspective and it easily fits into the framework of capitalism. So, there you go. <laughs> the next philosophy we're going to talk about is fairness. Uh, it's defined as a philosophy from the perspective of a creator to their creation, which can be used to describe artists and their work. It purports the idea that once a creator has finished creating, that is the point at which the creator no longer owns the life of the creation, rather, the creation's interaction with the rest of the world then becomes its meaning. The idea that those experiencing the creation own it once it has been finished. This idea can be used to explore the relationship a deity might have with humanity. It can also be used to explore a sort of death of the author sort of feel, if you know what that's all about. For the color pie, this one's a little bit more complex. Here we have an artistic philosophy, so that leads me more towards the red-blue sort of creativity. But if we delve into the actual philosophy here, we see something that expresses a lack of control. What this is essentially saying is that the audience determines the meaning of art, in a sort of death of the author like I said before. So I guess if we're trying to apply a color pie philosophy to death of the author, it makes me think, a little bit more of blue than red. That personal perspective creates reality, a very blue ideology. That each person has a say in what is true about art. 
But since the philosophy is more specifically talking about creating something, it still definitely is red. So I, I'll go back. Yeah, blue red is my final answer. But you could say it's most it's kind of mono blue or it's more weighted towards blue. The next one we're going to talk about is socialism, which we'll define as a political, social, and economic philosophy encompassing a range of economic and social systems characterized by social ownership of the means of production and workers' self-management of enterprises. The color pie of this one, well, guess. What do you think this one is? Come on, it's easy. We've been through it in so much of this video. You have to have learned it by now. It's white! Socialism is about workers owning the means of production. That means everyone has an equal ability to affect the things that they produce or how they're used and sold. A philosophy of equality and ownership of one's labor is going to be white. The next philosophy we'll talk about is nihilism. We're going to define it as the point of view or philosophy antithetical to the reputedly meaningful aspects of life. Most commonly, nihilism is presented in the form of existential nihilism, which argues that life is without objective meaning, purpose, or value. For the color pie, nihilism definitely starts off as black in nature, with its rejection of morality and meaning to life. However, it veers blue in its sort of contemplative leaning. One can be a nihilist with morals, it would just be morals that one decides for themselves rather than morals given by an external source like a religion or church. So blue-black it is for nihilism. Next one we're going to talk about is absurdism. Absurdism will define with the conflict between the human tendency to seek inherent value and meaning in life, and the human inability to find any in a purposeless, meaningless, or chaotic and irrational universe. The color pie on this one is similar to nihilism. Absurdism is black in its rejection of inherent value in life. However, absurdism substitutes the contemplativeness of blue with the chaos of red. So it's definitely red-black with its rejection of natural truths and its embracing of irrationality. Aestheticism is what we're on now, and we're going to define it with an intellectual and art movement supporting the emphasis of aesthetic values more than social or political themes for literature, fine art, music, and other arts. This means that art from this particular movement, it focuses more on being beautiful rather than having meaning. Essentially, art for art's sake. The color pie of aestheticism, well, when we think of art in the terms of the color pie, we obviously go straight to red-blue for its creativity. But we must also take into account the fact that art, as a creative outlet, often has some form of structural growth or skill building involved. As we talked about before, Jeskai, or white, blue, red, is the most artistically inclined color combination. Aestheticism is very concerned with improving the skill of artistry and creating examples to follow the creation of new art. Beauty is very important and the ability to create better or more pleasing art is lauded. So I would call the monks and sages of Jeskai believers in aestheticism. The next one is Buddhism. Most Buddhist traditions share the goal of overcoming suffering and the cycle of death and rebirth, either by the attainment of nirvana or through the path of Buddhahood. There are lots of different kinds of Buddhisms in the world, so this is just kind of the basic we're going to go with. We won't go into any of the color pies of very specific versions. So the color pie of this would be the idea of ascending through a cycle of life, it, it feels very green. The idea that you should do your best with the given state of your birth and that you will be rewarded in your next life based on what you did in this one. That is super straightforward as far as color pie philosophies go in the real world. It is green all the way, baby. The next philosophy we're going to talk about is egalitarianism. Definition, a school of thought within political philosophy that prioritizes equality for all people. Egalitarian doctrines are generally characterized by the idea that all humans are equal in fundamental worth and moral status. For the color pie, this is as white as any other col color pie philosophy could be. There is no room for any other colors here, it is super straightforward. Equality for all from birth is one of the key traits of white philosophy. I'd like to mention that many egalitarian philosophies awkwardly neglect that different people can be born into different circumstances, thus treating everyone the exact same doesn't always lead to full equality. But that's perfect for white, because if they neglect the status of someone's birth, then that fits into this ideology that white can't, won't see those sorts of things. I guess if it didn't do that, it could possibly be a green-white philosophy or something like that, but for now I would say it is a mono-white philosophy. The next philosophy we're going to talk about is Zudism. It is the process of cultural exchange over the course of centuries, resulting in two or more cultural identities becoming indistinguishable from one another. Or, 
the reverse, wherein a cultural identity splits for whatever reason over time, becoming distinct identities. This especially applies to the conjoining or separation of countries themselves. The color pie on this one, well, it's a bit more complex. So we'll take the community of white for what is culture without community, and we'll take the historicity of green because culture is all about historical identity. And then we'll take progress of blue because this is about changing, separating, or combining of cultures. So I think that gives us a fairly clear Bant philosophy or white, blue, green. Idealism is the diverse set of metaphysical philosophies which asserts that reality is in some way indistinguishable or inseparable from human understanding or perception. That it is in some sense mentally constituted or otherwise closely connected to ideas. So the color pie of idealism, well, to put it less obtusely, this philosophy, it's the idea that things should be a certain way, or that the universe is meant to be in the way that fits into human perception of right and wrong and natural. This is because it holds consciousness as the ultimate truth. What colors see things this way? Well, I would argue blue. Blue cares about thoughts and the mind. How a blue character identifies revolves around the way it thinks and acts, rather than how it looks or where it came from. So one could see this as an example of that emphasis on consciousness. As I tried to apply other colors to this theory, even mixed with blue, it just didn't fit properly, and there were too many conflicts for it to seem true, so mono blue it is. Next philosophy is libertarianism with an asterisk. It's a collection of political philosophies and movements that uphold liberty as the core principle. Libertarians seek to maximize political freedom and autonomy, emphasizing freedom of choice, voluntary association, and individual judgment. Libertarians share a skepticism of authority and state power, but they diverge on the scope of their opposition to existing economic and political systems. The color pie of libertarianism. I added the asterisk because I know what you are thinking, but I don't mean this. Rather, we will get to that. But here, I am just referring to the philosophy of liberty, which is one of the most modern red philosophies there could ever be. Freedom. Voluntarism. Red is nothing if not about freedom. Where libertarianism changes is all the different types that see the world a bit differently, and they see the application of liberty from different scopes. And that is where the other colors mix in with red. I'm going to go into two of those differing libertarian ideals right now. We're going to start with right-wing libertarianism, also known as libertarian capitalism. It's a political philosophy and a type of libertarianism that strongly supports capitalist property rights and defends market distribution of natural resources and private property. The term right libertarianism is used to distinguish this class of views on the nature of property and capital from left libertarianism, a type of libertarianism that combines self-ownership and an egalitarian approach to natural resources. The color pie of the right-wing libertarianism, well, the right-wing, it ranges in three major colors. It's black, it's white, and it's green. Depending on the philosophy of this value set, the right-wing ranges greatly. But none of those are red, you might say, in response to me just saying earlier that libertarian philosophy is mostly red. And that is because right-wing libertarianism, rather than be a majorly red movement that dips into one of the three colors for its right-wing ideals, it is a reverse. It is a movement based in black that dips its toes into red. It forgoes the green and white almost entirely. It's generally less interested in the social conservatism that would come from green, and it is wholly against the law structure of white. Now, I will say, this movement is incredibly inconsistent. Some who claim to subscribe to this movement still hold on to socially conservative ideals, contradicting the stated aims of liberty. What supposedly puts their movement on the right wing is their view of economics. And this is where black comes into play. It's a very individualistic view of economics. While they want everyone to be free to buy whatever they want and to do all the things they want in life, which is a very red ideal, they also think corporations should be able to do whatever they want to make money, and if someone gets screwed over, it's their own fault, and the system should not bail them out. I know I've gone on for a long time about this, but I have a lot to say, so bear with me. They believe in the free market, and they believe it will sort everything out, and that regulations will only make things worse. This is why they are all red black. Their idea of liberty is, leave me alone and let me do what I want. As you will see in the next philosophy, this differs greatly from other, older forms of libertarian philosophy. So, let's talk about that other libertarian philosophy. 
anarchism. We'll define it as a political movement that is highly skeptical towards authority and rejects all involuntary or coercive forms of hierarchy. It calls for the abolition of the state, which it holds to be undesirable, unnecessary, and harmful. Anarchism advocates for the replacement of the state with stateless societies and other forms of free association. So now let's get into the color pie of anarchism. Anarchism is a form of left libertarianism. You see that at the end of the definition there, free association? Right and left-wing libertarianism have that in common. They don't think a government should tell you how to live. They think people should be free as long as they don't harm others. That is a very, very red concept. So obviously anarchism is red. Now here's where the color pie gets a little sticky. As you have probably noticed a couple of times already in this video, the colors can begin to contradict themselves when combined with other colors. But that is where the flexibility of the color pie comes in handy. As I said at the top of the video, not all characters or groups who could be described as one or more colors have all of the traits of the colors they subscribe to. In fact, some completely reject some parts of their own philosophy. This is especially true when multiple colors combine. So here, with anarchism, I will make a bold statement about its color alignment. Anarchism is red-white. Do you see the big conflict yet? White is about law and order. Anarchism is the exact opposite, right? Well, not exactly. The word anarchy comes from the medieval Latin word anarchia, and then from the Greek word anarchos. You've seen the words like monarchy and oligarchy, which end similarly. Those both also come from the term archos, which refers to a ruler. The prefix an meaning without, so anarchos literally means without ruler. As many modern day anarchists could tell you, it's not about chaos or lawlessness, it's about a flattened power structure. Anyway, let me get back into the color pie. This is white. Removing the common reverence for authority that white has in favor of the equality and community of it. Since anarchism is left-wing libertarianism, it has the same red parts of right-wing libertarianism, but it replaces the black of capitalism with the white of socialist ideals. That is, making resources and necessary needs accessible to all at the same level. We don't need to go into how anarchists say they would do this without hierarchical structures. Just go watch some leftists or anarchist YouTubers, they'll tell you. I'm just here to talk about the color pie philosophies in Frogger. I can't help that I'm a very political person and it always bleeds into all of my videos. Okay, so yeah, anarchism, white-red, but mostly red. Alright, next philosophy. Ugh. Objectivism. Read another book. <laughs> Ayn Rand was an awful person with bad ideas, but uh... <laughs> Objectivism's main tenets are that reality exists independently of consciousness, that human beings have a direct contact with reality through sense perception, that one can attain objective knowledge from perception through the process of concept formation and inductive logic. That the proper moral purpose in one's life is to pursuit of one's own happiness. And that the only social system consistent with its morality is the one that displays full respect for individual rights embodied in laissez-faire capitalism. That's where you lost me, bud. And that the role of art in human life is to transform humans' metaphysical ideas by selective reproduction of reality into physical form. A work of art that one can comprehend and to which one can respond emotionally. Can you see where this goes wrong? It starts off like, okay, sure, reality is real, yada yada yada. And then it goes into capitalism is the only way to be free. Like, what a leak, bro. Anyway, the color pie of objectivism is... Blech. Do I have to... Well, anyway, since objectivism has roots in being the opposite of idealism, we can look at the enemies of blue, right? Nah, not so fast. You see, the interesting thing about blue is its truth-seeking nature. And while one idealist might approach truth-seeking differently than an objectivist, they both seek truth. So hey, what do you know? They're both blue. However, there are a couple factors that might add another color in here. We will keep from going into the capitalism part of objectivist philosophy. Instead, we will just focus on the reality is constant sort of thinking. So, if the idea is that reality is what it is, whether we believe it or not, no matter what we think, and that we should just accept that, I can see this also as green. The sort of nature is what it is idea. But I can also see that this is a little bit red, since the definition spoke of pursuing one's own happiness, regardless. If I were to give this a color combination philosophy, I would say that it's majorly blue, 
with a splash of both red and green, depending on which parts of the philosophy you would focus on. And if, like Ayn Rand, you just focus on how to help justify capitalism with it, it just becomes blue-black. Next color pie philosophy thingy we're going to talk about here, boys, is transhumanism. God, this shit's cool. It's a philosophical movement that advocates for the transformation of the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies to greatly enhance the human intellect and physiology. The color body of transhumanism, well, if you remember the other part I talked about in the previous part of the video, it's blue. It's very blue. It's so blue. It's technology. Self-improvement. Oh, but what's this? Widely available, huh? One could argue this dips into white. If... The movement wants this sort of self-improvement to be easily available to all, then that means that they don't believe that someone's status in life should inhibit them from being a part of the technological movement. So, a little bit of white. If not, then like our friend Tezzeret and his Ethereum, this can quickly delve into the blue-black territory where only the ones who can afford it are allowed to advance themselves in transhumanism. Next philosophy is utilitarianism, which we'll define as a family of consequentialist ethical theories that promote action to maximize happiness and well-being for the affected individuals. Essentially, do the thing that hurts the least amount and helps the most amount. You can debate on this often boils down to how one quantifies least or most in a given scenario. So the color pie of this, well, I believe this to be a philosophy of do the logical thing from the perspective of someone who has it, it feels very blue to remove the humanity and emotions from a scenario and boil a problem down to numbers. But this philosophy also cares about doing the best for the most number of people. The numbers care about what's fair in this instance, which leads me to think white. So, numbers plus fair leads me to believe this is a white-blue philosophy. Okay, here I am, concluding the video. Holy crap, that was so many lists and colors, and I said the color and color pie and philosophy probably 300 times in this video. There's probably a counter up here that Christian created. I'm the worst. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, but also I have a challenge and a request from you, our audience, which is probably like a couple people, but it's fine. I, I have fun. The challenge is to take a character from something you like or a group of something and try to apply the color pie to it yourself using the stuff I talked about in this video. And the request I have is to comment down below any noun at all, just any noun, person, place, or thing, and I will give you the color pie philosophy of that noun. I will do it for all of the comments. No joke, do it. Our audience is small, so I can get away with doing this right now. <laughs> but after a while, I won't be able to do anything like that ever again. Anyway, anyway, thank you for watching, and remember, if you think I'm wrong, you're probably right. Sourcefed was rat. Hey, keep that in the video. Let everyone know that I thought Sourcefed was rat. Anyway. <laughs>